the family tree for everybody alive today. These are two pieces of DNA that we use quite widely in our work. Mitochondrial DNA tracing a purely maternal line of descent. You get your MT DNA from your mother and your mother's mother. All the way back to the very first woman. The Y chromosome, the piece of DNA that makes men men, traces a purely paternal line of descent. Everybody in this room, everybody in the world, falls into a lineage somewhere on these trees. Now, even though these are simplified versions of the real trees, they're still kind of complicated, so let's simplify them, turn them on their sides, combine them so that they look like a tree with the root at the bottom and the branches going up. What's the take-home message? Well, the thing that jumps out at you first is that the deepest lineages in our family trees are found within Africa, among Africans. That means that Africans have been accumulating this mutational diversity for longer. And what that means is that we originated in Africa. It's written in our DNA. Every piece of DNA we look at has greater diversity within Africa than outside of Africa. And at some point in the past, a subgroup of Africans left the African continent to go out and populate the rest of the world. Now, how recently do we share this ancestry? Was it millions of years ago? which we might suspect by looking at all this incredible variation around the world. No, the DNA tells a story that's very clear. Within the last 200,000 years, we all share an ancestor, a single person, mitochondrial Eve, you might have heard about her, in Africa, an African woman who gave rise to all the mitochondrial diversity in the world today. But what's even more amazing is that if you look at the Y chromosome side, the male side of the story, the Y chromosome Adam only lived around 60,000 years ago. That's only about 2,000 human generations, the blink of an eye in an evolutionary sense. That tells us we were all still living in Africa at that time. This was an African man who gave rise to all the Y chromosome diversity around the world. It's only within the last 60,000 years that we have started to generate this incredible diversity we see around the world. Such an amazing story. We're all effectively part of an extended African family. Now, that seems so recent. Why didn't we start to leave earlier? Why didn't? Homo erectus evolved into separate species, or subspecies rather, human races around the world. Why was it that we, we seem to have come out of Africa so recently? Well, that's a, that's a big question. These why questions, particularly in genetics and the study of history in general, are always the big ones, the ones that are tough to answer. And so, when all else fails, talk about the weather. What was going on to the world's weather around 60,000 years ago? Well, we were going into the worst part of the last ice age. Last ice age started roughly 120,000 years ago. It went up and down, and it really started to accelerate around 70,000 years ago. Lots of evidence from sediment cores and the pollen types, oxygen isotopes, and so on. We hit the last glacial maximum around 16,000 years ago, but basically, from 70,000 years on, things were getting really tough, getting very cold. The northern hemisphere had massive growing ice sheets. New York City, Chicago, Seattle, all under a sheet of ice, most of Britain, all of Scandinavia, covered by ice several kilometers thick. Now, Africa is the most tropical continent on the planet. About 85% of it lies between Cancer and Capricorn. And there aren't a lot of glaciers here, except on the high mountains here in East Africa. So what was going on here? We weren't covered in ice in Africa. Rather, Africa was drying out at that time. This is a paleoclimatological map of what Africa looked like between 60 and 70,000 years ago, reconstructed from all these pieces of evidence that I mentioned before. The reason for that is that ice actually sucks moisture out of the atmosphere. If you think about Antarctica, it's technically a desert. It gets so little precipitation. So the whole world was drying out. The sea levels were dropping. And Africa was turning to desert. The Sahara was much bigger then than it is now. And the human habitat was reduced to just a few small pockets compared to what we have today. The evidence from genetic data is that the human population around this time, roughly 70,000 years ago, crashed to fewer than 2,000 individuals. We nearly went extinct. We were hanging on by our fingernails. And then something happened. Great illustration of it. Look at some stone tools. The ones on the left are from Africa, from around a million years ago. The ones on the right were made by Neanderthals, our distant cousins, not our direct ancestors, living in Europe, and they date from around 50 or 60,000 years ago. Now, at the, the risk of offending any paleoanthropologists or physical anthropologists in the audience, basically, there's not a lot of change between these two stone tool groups. The ones on the left are pretty similar to the ones on the right. We are in a period of long cultural stasis from a million years ago until around 60 to 70,000 years ago. The tool styles don't change that much. The evidence is that the human way of life didn't change that much during that period. 
But then, 50, 60, 70,000 years ago, somewhere in that region, all hell breaks loose. Art makes its appearance. The stone tools become much more finely crafted. The evidence is that humans begin to specialize in particular prey species at particular times of the year. The population size started to expand. Probably, according to what many linguists believe, fully modern language, syntactic language, subject, verb, object that we use to convey complex ideas, like I'm doing now, appeared around that time. We became much more social. The social networks expanded. This change in behavior allowed us to survive these worsening conditions in Africa, and they allowed us to start to expand around the world. We've been talking at this conference about African success stories. Well, you want the ultimate African success story? Look in the mirror. You're it. The reason you're alive today is because of those changes in our brains that took place in Africa, probably somewhere in the region where we're sitting right now, around 60, 70,000 years ago. Allowing us not only to survive in Africa, but to expand out of Africa, an early coastal migration along the south coast of Asia, leaving Africa around 60,000 years ago, reaching Australia very rapidly by 50,000 years ago. Slightly later migration up into the Middle East. These would have been savanna hunters. So those of you who are going on one of the, the post-conference tours, you'll get to see what a real savanna is like, and it's basically a meat locker. People who would have specialized in killing the animals, hunting the animals on those meat locker savannas, moving up, following the grasslands into the Middle East around 45,000 years ago, during one of the, the rare wet phases in the Sahara, migrating eastward, following the grasslands, because that's what they were adapted to live on. And when they reached Central Asia, they reached what was effectively a steppe superhighway, a grassland superhighway. The grasslands at that time, this is during the last ice age, stretched basically from Germany all the way over to Korea and the entire continent was open to them. Entering Europe around 35,000 years ago, and finally a small group migrating up through the worst weather imaginable. Siberia, inside the Arctic Circle, during the last ice age, temperatures of minus 70, minus 80, even minus 100 perhaps, migrating into the Americas, ultimately reaching that final frontier. An amazing story, and it happened first in Africa, the changes that allowed us to do that, the evolution of this highly adaptable brain that we all carry around with us, allowing us to create novel cultures, allowing us to develop the diversity that we see on a whirlwind trip like the one I've just been on. Now, that story I just told you is literally a whirlwind tour of how we populated the world, the great paleolithic wanderings of our species. And that's the story that I told a couple of years ago in my book, The Journey of Man, and the film that we made, the same title. And as we were finishing up that film, it was co-produced with National Geographic, I started talking to the folks at, at NG about this work, and they got really excited about it. They, you know, they liked the film, but they said, you know, we really see this as kind of the next wave in the study of human origins, where we all came from, using the tools of DNA to uh, map the migrations around the world. You know, study of human origins is kind of in our DNA, and we want to take it to the next level. What do you want to do next? Which is a great question to be asked by National Geographic. And I said, well, you know, what I've sketched out here is just that. It is a very coarse sketch of how we migrated around the planet. And it's based on a few thousand people we've sampled from you know, a handful of populations around the world, studied a, a few genetic markers, and there are lots of gaps on this map where we've just connected the dots. What we need to do is increase our sample size by an order of magnitude or more. Hundreds of thousands of DNA samples from people all over the world. And that was the genesis of the Genographic Project. The project launched in uh, April of 2005. It has three core components. Obviously, science is a big part of it the field research that we're doing around the world with indigenous peoples, people who've lived in the same location for a long period of time, retain a connection to the place where they live that many of the rest of us have lost. So my ancestors come from all over northern Europe. I live in the eastern seaboard of North America when I'm not traveling. Where am I indigenous to? Nowhere, really. My genes are all jumbled up. But there are people who retain that link to their ancestors that allows us to contextualize the DNA results. That's the focus of the field research, centers that we've set up all over the world, 10 of them, top population geneticists. But in addition, we wanted to open up this study to anybody around the world. How often do you get to participate in a big scientific project, the Human Genome Project, or a Mars rover mission? In this case, you actually can. You can go onto our website, nationalgeographic.com slash genographic. You can order a kit. You can test your own DNA. And you can actually submit those results to the database and tell us a little bit about your genealogical background, have the data analyzed as part of the scientific effort. Now, this is all a nonprofit enterprise.